we are uh, ops team of Wikia. My name is Paweł Rein. Uh, my name is Łukasz, and we are part of the ops team, actually. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with what Wikia is? Anybody? Not ex or current employees. <laughs> okay, so you can think of Wikia as, uh, if you think of Wikipedia as uh, encyclopedia, you can think of Wikia as a library of books. So we, we have over 300,000 books, so-called wikis, on different topics. What you see on the screen is an example, it's a Poznań wiki. We have a wiki of Poznań, and what, what's different between, uh, what differs us from Wikipedia is that there's no article on some, on, on met, this meteor, this is meteor that landed in Poznań some time ago, but this is, a, this is something that, that is too small to, for Wikipedia, or too custom, or fits only some people's interest. In, on, in Wikia, you can have wiki on any subject that, that, that you are passionate about, and you can write any article on just whatever you want. So, some numbers about Wikia. Uh, we are not such a small company, because we got 1.5 billion global page views every month. We got 92 million global unique visitors with over 300,000 wikis, with over 200 languages, and at the moment we are top 100 at Comscore and uh, 50, top 50 in Quancast. So, If you've seen yesterday's Brian McAllister talk about SaaS systems lifecycle, you more or less know what road we had to go to be where we are now. For the last couple of years, the traffic growth was quite constant. So you might think that the traffic is predictable, till it's not. This is uh, traffic of one of our top 20 wikis, Call of Duty wiki. And uh, this, this moment, <laughs> You can see there is uh, November last year when the new release of game was released. Uh, luckily for us, our traffic is read heavy, so most of visitors are coming to read the content, not to edit it. So the spike was uh, mostly hit our CDN, not our backend. So we survived it nicely. When dealing with large traffic, even small change can cost you much. <laughs> so uh, things will break, we know that, of course. But to react fast, we need to measure, we need to know what's going on. We so we got over 200,000 uh, ganglia metrics for only our main colo and 4,500 uh, 4, services checks in AGOs. Also, we use some external services like Pingdom, Website Pools, Knote, or New Relic. We're collecting JavaScript errors. Anybody uh, here collect the JavaScript errors? Raise your hand, who's collecting uh, errors from the user's browser? <laughs> Not many people. Okay. So when the sheet breaks, it's better when you have uh, as many data as possible. So there's a chance, you're giving yourself a chance to diagnose the problem fast by looking at graphs and browsing recent logs. New Relic. Application monitoring. This is this is just awesome thing. How many of you are using New Relic or stuff like this? Yeah, more people now. <laughs> Great. So the vertical lines show 
events like code pushes. There's a, there's a stacked view of uh, response time divided by layers like PHP, database, and web external. This is, this is the super fast overview of what went wrong and where. And uh, one more question. Who of you is using PagerDuty or paging yourself other way? Oh, okay. 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 So we, we're using PagerDuty to wake up, wake us up at night. Or actually not, because we, since we are a distributed team between states and, and, and Poland, we have nine hour difference between two parts of our team. We don't have to wake up, night, uh, wake up at night, because when we're sleeping, PagerDuty calls San Francisco. There are three people in our ops team in San Francisco and three people in Poland. So uh, this allows us to keep uh, an eye on the site almost around the clock, but there are also some challenges connected with that. How do you synchronize knowledge between two parts of this uh, team? How do you avoid stepping on each other's toes? Communication. This is what, need, what needs to work. We're chatting on IRC during overlap hours. There's always a couple of hours when we overlap. We send hand of emails, but directions each day so that other part knows the progress of things and knows of all the changes. And we got, for example, ops log for all important information we, we need. So every, every tool we oh, use or <coughs> uh, every person can send their some log information that is useful <laughs> for other members of the team. So for example, all pushes to GitHub or or major uh, outage at Nigeria's are stored there, so we can easily search, check what happened in last 24 hours, or check history for some event. Also, some external tools like New Relic, Ping Down, Website Pools also left their uh, small information with some meta tags, so we can easily to search it or excluded. I've mentioned code reviews. Infrastructure is code. So if it's not in Chef, it doesn't exist. Code reviews that we happen to be doing with using GitHub pull requests are giving whole team the visibility of every single little change that's happening. That prevents us from stepping on each other's to toes or breaking things that you are not aware that other part has done. Also, when, we're, when working with such a small team, as, as I mentioned, there's only six people split by, the, by, by two teams, you need to be tech generalist. There's no place for T-shaped specialist are you uh, familiar with T-shaped specialist concept? That's, yeah, so, so the comp-shaped specialist is a person that knows something about everything in your infrastructure so that you can play with any failure or work on any project just by just uh, without any, without calling the, uh, without talking to, to the person of uh, uh, that is assigned as a primary responsible for the for the area. We want our failures to be easy to handle. So, as I mentioned, so that anyone in the team can handle any failure without need, needing to wake somebody up or looking for help someplace else. This is the uh, slide stolen from Arthur Bergman, Bergman's presentation. Arthur Bergman work, worked with Wikia for a couple of years. So we, we are 
optimizing from MTTR, median time to uh, mean time to recovery, instead of optimizing from mean time between failures. And this 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 slide, sh I think it shows it nicely because the car on the right was optimized to fail, uh, to not fail. But when it fails, you you need lots of time to fix it or spe uh, or specialized uh, garage to fix it. And the car on the left was optimized so that anyone can fix it quickly. It's, it's, it's delivered to you with a set of tools that anyone can use. There's a, there's a movie on YouTube uh, you can watch that where, when, uh, in which the couple of uh, soldiers are uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, dismantling and rebuilding the, the car in under four minutes. <laughs> this is possible. So we want everybody in in ops team should should be aiming for infrastructure that is easy to rebuild in four minutes or <laughs> something like this. Not 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 try to uh, not waste your time trying to prevent failures, but just be ready for failure. Other part is our automatic, automated failover. So at the moment we got two data centers in two different areas. Uh, the main one is at San Jose, and the other one is Iowa. It's about 60 milliseconds from San Jose. <laughs> and basically, these three lines uh, switch the data center with something happened and we are not able to serve any more content from our main DC so it's there are of course more of logic to to do it but these three lines just switch the DC and we are start serving uh, content for our users from our backup DC uh, this backup DC is, isn't fully active active so we only serve their uh, read only content so but but still we are read heavy so it's not a big problem for us how many of you have faced such a descriptive alert so it's also important to when when you are on call to quickly know what actually is happening where's the problem by looking at this is the example of not not that of the alert don't wrong. <laughs> what does it mean that all deploy hosts available from deployment system, system are critical? Does it mean that all machines in some cluster are down or which, how, what number of machines have the problem and what, what, exa what exactly does it mean to, to the business? So just a bad example. <laughs> also, it's really important to readable code. For example, you see what was changed. Can anybody tell what changed it? <laughs> okay, you, you didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really important to to make really clean and simple code so everyone easily can see what happened, what was changed, why it was changed, and if it's something wrong, fix it. And at the moment, we want to stop a little at our important uh, failures or maybe funny failures from yeah. last year that we uh, that happened and what what we learned from from these events. So first one, everyone knows what this uh, HTML meta tags means. Everyone knows. Who, who doesn't know? Okay, so uh, that basically means you are going out from every search index because all the spider bots will remove this web page if they or remove and or stop stop uh, indexing it in the future. And by small accident, one of our developers. Uh, put this HTML meta tags in some 
method that was actually run at every single web page we got. So uh, as a result, in three days, we completely get out from Google. Uh, it cost us about 200 million page views and about one week to get back at Google. And at Quantcast, you can see there is a small hole. It was this event. <laughs> yeah, this, this, can you, yeah. this is be, between here and here. This is 2 million uh, page views, and it's daily. So the drop-down is really s significant. What we learn, we start monitoring meta tags at web page. Who monitor here meta tags? So maybe you should, because it can be painful. Uh, also, we add some additional steps for QA to, to check it before every release, just, just in case. This is a fun story, actually. So the, our backup data center is in uh, Iowa, in the middle of cornfields. There's no, there's no city, no village anywhere near because it was uh, hidden from maps. This is uh, post-Cold War uh, atomic bunker with silos for missiles, and it was converted to DC. So it has many advantages, for example, that you cannot destroy it, <laughs> but it's, it's also, it, it has disadvantages. There's only one uh, fiber line getting to the colo. So, and it's also overhead, so that uh, farmers working in the fields can break it. <laughs> but this time it wasn't uh, the farmer's fault. It was, uh, the, so there's a city, or actually village, seven, 17 miles from the colo, uh, away from the data center, and there was five hour power outage in there. And there's a fiber node. The fiber node has a standby power uh, with one hour battery runtime. And the operator of this line dispatched the technician after the fiber went down, so after this one hour. So the power goes out. One hour after the, the line goes down, the technician is dispatched. He gets to the place in one hour, <laughs> and he connected the inverter to the, he disconnected the UPS, connected the inverter in this place, connected to, it, uh, to, to his car, and uh, because he was short on sleep, he went sleeping. <laughs> so uh, the owner of the colo, Jerry, was trying to find out what's, what's going on because the uh, the internet access was flapping up and down. So he, after he couldn't uh, get the information from the, from the operator's ISP's uh, call center, he jumped into his car and just went there to see the guy sleeping in the car. And the inventor beeping, screaming, because the node uh, cabinet was stayed open, and the air, air conditioning was trying to you know, get the temperature back to normal. So that power uh, consumption went up, and this, this couldn't be handled by the, by the inventor. <laughs> yeah, so the, what we've learned is that although this backup DC can fail sometimes for three hours or something like this, but when we are planning to go active-active, it's not that fun anymore. We want to move to somewhere where we have more ISPs, more power sources, so. We are planning to change DC for. Yeah, we, we, we're planning to moving to East Coast to some bigger data, data center. Uh, the other outages was, oh, maybe this one wasn't really outages, but uh, it was really unexpected. We've seen this slide today, but it's really, it show everything about this, this problem. Uh, with little, small mistake in Chef, 
the whole production uh, without our knowledge upgrade PHP to newer version. And we, we noticed that after everything was done. So, uh, so we're the, DevOps. We've, we practiced this out. <laughs> it's working, really. So the lessons we learned from that, we only use now internal repo. We merge internal repo with upstream only manual. We need to know what will be changed, what packages will be changed, what will happen, and what possible can happen. We also declarate in Chef uh, version for every package, so it's not anymore possible to, to upgrade some, some packages with dependencies. So every package needs to have version. How many of you remember the leap second of death? A couple of people, yes. So on last year, between June and July, actually the first, first night of July, on Saturday, atomic clocks were held back by one second to, in order to keep them in sync with uh, Earth planet daily rotation. Apparently, when one second was, were, were added, was added, NTP didn't handle it well. <laughs> so uh, the same day, we went down. As you can see, this is, this is the load uh, of Apache cluster. And this is midnight. And we UTC. got about 4,000 yeah. load. And, and, and all ops team was heading to San Francisco that day. We, are, we were actually, on Sunday, we were waking up, recovering from the jet lag. <laughs> There was only one person in Poland, but it was 1 a.m. in Poland. So that was not the best moment to discover that your site is down and you don't know what's happening. <laughs> but luckily, we handled to fix it quite fast. It was two and a half hours to bring the, bring the site back. And, yeah, and Googling the problem out helped a lot because there was large uh, gossip on the internet on, on wh wh what's going on. Yeah, the, the lessons learned is nothing actually surprising. <laughs> Expect unexpected. <laughs> but it will happen again, so be prepared. Null code release. Uh, we use GitHub and we use now GitHub for everything and we deploy code based on what release we got in GitHub. So we download Tarball and deploy it to all the host. But if you use enough frequently uh, GitHub, you will notice they mostly works, but sometimes they got some problems. For example, they can serve you empty Tarball. So deploy team deploy code to all the Apaches, and everywhere it was empty directory, nothing more. So automatically, we end up with our backup DC in a few minutes. So uh, buy technology from, from other companies, for example, like GitHub, but build monitoring for it. You, you need to expect that they can fail somehow. Yeah. one way or another, but they will fail fast, sooner or later. Uh, that's it. This is referring to the Paul Hammond's talk from yesterday. I don't know how many of you have, have seen it. He was adv telling you us to rather buy than, than build because people time is, is more it's expensive. Important. And this is actually right. We're just adding one more step to that. <laughs> OK, this one was also quite funny, because as our CDN, we use Fastly, and Fastly used Varnish. And we got some kind of inline C code inside our VCLs. And there is a like small, small problem. If you define some string, you need to put at the front the size of the string. And one of our developers 
change the string, size of the string, without changing uh, actual declarate size. And he deployed this. And in the minute, uh, all of our niche across the world just crash, crash our website and all customers for Fastly. So <laughs> as a result, we don't have any more access to inline C. We can only modify our uh, VCLs because they are enough safe. We can validate and check is it working with inline C. It's almost impossible. Uh, so we got this nice panel to do it, and it's really working. What we learn, uh, you need to really be careful what you are doing. Uh, it's really important if there are some areas of high risk, you need to decide who can do it, and for the best, someone should check it twice before you release it. Consistently. So it's again with our uh, CDN. If you use CDN, uh, you expect that across all the nodes you will get the same content. That's, that's how CDN is working. But what will happen if you, if you start getting content from a little different at some, some place? Uh, Okay, so back. Um, we got such, such problem. It was, of course, weekend, because all outages happened at weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got some uh, notifi notification from our customers that we got, we got problem at one location. I really don't remember which part of the world it was, but I guess it's somewhere in Europe. And it was really, really hard to reproduce this error because we, we really don't know what happened. Uh, now we know it was problem with, with content, but they just report us that we got web page isn't loading correct. And we start digging and digging. And one of the developers, after a few hours, discovered that at one of the links where it should be JavaScript, we serve CSS instead. So, uh, solution was really easy. We just pulled this object and everything back to normal. But after this event, a uh, member of performance team create <clears throat> this nice tool so we can just... Yeah, so if you're not colorblind, then you can tell uh, which of your CDN nodes may have problems with objects consistency. Each vertical column is, uh, is one pop at the CDN, and the lines are different objects. So, so all points in the line should be the same color. <laughs> also, it checks is it uh, compressed content and uncompressed content the same, because for the varnishes, two different objects. And it can, we can easily port or reload one of the links we use from, from the page. Uh, if you point your uh, mouse on any dot, you will see all the headers from, from the request. So we can easily check what, what, what is wrong, wh from where this uh, request came from, and all the information. So what we learn, learn again. Buy technology from others, but build monitoring for it and try to predict what can go wrong, even if, if this shouldn't happen never, but it did. Yeah, the g general lesson, always do post-mortem. Write your blameless RCAs, read them, collect the, the knowledge. Of course, we are hurrying. <laughs> yeah, if you so if you are interested, you can talk with us or just visit our web page for more information. Any questions? Qu 
question about uh, versioning and uh, chef. You mentioned uh, that uh, you have uh, every package uh, version in chef. Uh, is that true for every uh, main package or every package including libraries and so on? Uh, we're working on that to every package got a version, because, always. Because of dependencies, for example. There are problems sometimes with dependencies, so we, we try to uh, put version always. Okay, so we are losing uh, the feature of uh, automatic uh, dependency solving, right? Yes, we okay. don't want that. <laughs> because this can cause some problems. For example, you, 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 you get update of one packages and then half of your, of your system is up, start upgrading without your knowledge and you don't know what's happening. Yeah, the, 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 the event with PHP upgrade was actually caused by dependency. Yep. Because my main PHP package wasn't upgraded. It was, actually, it was the problem because all the PHP cookbook was create correct, but in some other cookbook there was some include with, with some package for PHP module for Apache, and that starts all the yeah, upgrades. Also, also known problem nesting and including increasing complexity. And, yeah. So, hmm? any other questions? Oh, okay. This is a, Um, great talk. I, it's always good to listen to experiences. So I was curious to learn how you found the problem that crashed vanishes, the inline C problem. How did you how do you diagnose something like this? The problem with what? With so, vanishes. Are this uh, this string length the wrong string length problem? If you oh, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So the the fact that we were able to manipulate the inline C code in VCS in our CDN was because our CDN was run by guys formerly working with us. So we are friends and the special, uh, special rights were access. granted to us. Uh, and we found out because whole the CDN went down. I mean, we didn't know what happened, but they, they knew in a while. Arthur Bergman, who runs Fastly, as, do you, do you, have you heard of him or seen his presentation? Maybe, anyway, he diagnosed it and you know, responded. It was only a few, few minutes of outage, but we lost all the cash across the world. The response was loud and full of what the fuck, but <laughs> as you can <laughs> imagine. It was easy because it was last, last chain to deploy to, to production, so you just roll back to, to, to the previous one and it starts working, then you can search what was wrong. And also van Vanish, when it validates the VCL, it doesn't check the C code uh, syntax correctness. And also the syntax was correct because actually it was just the parameter passed to the function. So function was expecting something different. <laughs> it was not, not, to, not so easy to, to see if you don't understand what the function was doing. I see, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. There's uh, lunch break starting soon. The next one actually is a lunch break, so this oh. one will be for coffee, so thank you guys.